Now, you also have to realize that Mormonism is a political faith. It's very much a political faith. Uh, in, in the beginnings of Mormonism, they had what was called the United Order. They believe it's their prophetic destiny to take over America. They early on in the church experimented with communism, which was the United Order, but it didn't work very well. Communism never works very well. But they are taught that it will come back during the millennium. There's also the belief that is taught by prophecies within the Mormon church that at some time the Constitution will hang by a thread and the elders of Israel will be the only ones who can save it when it is about to be brought down. Now you need to realize something else. Mormons are taught that the United States Constitution is an inspired document, just like the Bible, just like the Book of Mormon, that it came forth by divine revelation. Now, in spite of Mormons having this public image of being very patriotic, you know, very, very honorable people, what many do not realize is that up until the 1970s, Mormon people in the temple called down curses upon the President of the United States and upon the government of the United States and called upon God to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith, who were of course killed in Carthage, Illinois in 1844. This was part of their sacred temple rites and this has never been repented of. Now there was also a secret elite order that Joseph Smith started in his day and is still around to this day. It was originally called the Council of Yitfif. Now you might say, what is Yitfif? Well, Yitfif is 50 spelled backwards. Uh, that's real, real occult there, you know. And anyway, before it was called the Council of Yitfif, it was called the Illuminati, which is rather interesting. Within this council, Joseph was crowned King of the United States. This council later on morphed into what was known in the 1970s and 80s as the Freeman Institute. And then in the late 1980s, the name was changed to the National Center of Constitutional Studies. This group was started by W. Cleon Skousen, who's well known among John Birch Society members. In fact, it's interesting that you will find that, generally speaking, John Birch Societies are more or less crawling with Mormons. And these are the groups by which the Mormon Church today maintains its political agenda as best it can. Then there's LDS political activism. Many, many Mormons are at high levels of the CIA and the FBI. At one time, four of the five Joint Chiefs of Staff were Mormons. Many of the highest presidential advisors have been LDS in the past. Significant LDS statements right now in the LDS church. In the past, we had George Romney, governor of, of Michigan. Today, we have Orrin Hatch, the senator from Utah, and Mitt Romney, of course, who we all know. There's then also, right now, just recently emerging, the interesting problem of Glenn Beck. He has been a major spokesman in the last year or two for quote-unquote right-wing Christianity, even though he is, of course, a Mormon. He does say that every now and then, and, and if you read any of his books, you find it out. And even though I think his ten intentions and goals seem to be good, this is a very troubling situation, partly because Christian people like David Barton are appearing on his show, giving him legitimacy, uh, but also, one time, he had the leader of the National Center of Constitutional Studies, which is a Mormon organization, on his show as a respected scholar. So he is, he is doing his best to mainstream Mormonism using his TV show. So one week you might have Jerry Falwell Jr. on the show, or David Barton, or some other respected Christian individual, and on the next week, you might have a Mormon on, and there's no attempt to, to distinguish any of these. And as I mentioned earlier, remember, Glenn Beck believes the Constitution is divinely, <coughs> excuse me, divinely inspired. It most certainly is not. Glenn's persona makes him an excellent spokesman for conservative LDS values, and he may very well pave the way for fellow Mormon Mitt Romney to gain the Republican nomination, because what Glenn Beck is doing is he's mainstreaming Mormonism. He's making Mormonism more friendly, more cuddly, if you will. Um, and this is something that's quite worrisome, and I'll tell you why. Um, here is the problem with uh, someone like Mitt Romney or any other Mormon leader. Most people don't know Mitt Romney is a high priest in the Mormon church. 
and uh, he is, of course, a, a belongs to a very old, powerful Mormon family. And I don't deny that the guy is probably a very good administrator, a very good executive. I know he pretty much saved the Salt Lake Olympics a few years ago. But the problem is, is Mormons believe they have a destiny to take over America. And um, the way they think they're going to do this is they believe that when it is time to save the Constitution, quote unquote, that a Mormon will be elected president or vice president. Now, you've got to realize something. Mormons take oaths in the temple that they will obey the brethren over their country. And so therefore, every Mormon is actually a dual loyalist. They have their first loyalty is always to the prophet of the LDS church. And if a Mormon vice president is elected, they believe the president will die and then the Mormon will become president. And then they believe that he will be declared prophet. And this is where this, this so-called white horse prophecy comes in, uh, where, where Brigham Young and Joseph Smith both taught that, that uh, when the Constitution of the United States hangs by a thread, this one mighty and strong, quote unquote, quote, this one man would come in, either literally or figuratively, on a white horse, and he would save the Constitution of the United States and essentially set up a benevolent dictatorship. And he will bring back the United Order, which is this communitarian form of government that the U.S., um, that, that, pardon me, the Mormon Church had in the 19th century. And what's weird about all that is that it's very, very strangely like what we, we read in Revelation 6. In verse 1, it says, and when I, when I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the voice of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. And him that sat on him was a bow, had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, of course, most Bible expositors believe that is the Antichrist, the beast. And here the Mormons are saying that their prophet will be that. And it's important to realize that um, the Mormons are very wealthy as a church. They have done their level best to buy up thousands of acres of farmland, to gain control of food production in many parts of the United States. And this is what they believe their destiny will be. When a Mormon, prop, when a Mormon president is, is declared to be president, he will be made prophet and he will become the one mighty and strong. Now what's interesting is we close with something that kind of make you give pause to thinking about Mitt Romney as president. I'm going to tell you the shocking secret of the Washington, D.C. temple, which very few people know about. That used to be our temple. When I was a Mormon, it was the closest temple that we would go to to do our, our temple work. Even though we lived in Milwaukee, now there are temples much closer to Milwaukee, but back then it was the Washington, D.C. temple. This is a big, gorgeous temple. I think it's probably the biggest temple in the world. And it's in Silver Springs, Maryland. And um, when I was going there, I ran into a Mormon who was a Secret Service agent. And a lot of Mormons are in the Secret Service or the FBI or whatever. And he sat down with me and told me a secret. He said, do you know what's on the fifth floor of this temple? And I said, no. And uh, he said, well, you've noticed you can't go up there even though you hold a temple recommend. And I said, yeah, I noticed that. Because I was up on the fourth floor, I think it was, doing ceilings for time and all eternity for deceased family members. And I noticed you could not go up to the fifth floor. It was locked. And he said, there's a reason for that. And I said, okay, I'll bite. What's the reason? He said, have you ever seen an aerial photograph of the Washington, D.C. temple? And I said, no, I don't believe I have. And he took me to the store, the little you know, store that they have, and showed me a postcard that showed an aerial view of the temple. And guess what's in the absolute center of the roof of the temple? This very large hemispherical dome. And he said, you know what's under that dome? And I said, no. He said, that has all the telemetry that the White House has. It's so powerful that they actually have to reroute airplanes around the temple. And he said that underneath that dome is an exact replica of the Oval Office. And we believe that someday our Mormon prophet will run this country from the fifth floor of that temple. 
That's why that temple was built. And it's got, you know, he says, if you were in that room, you would think you were in the Oval Office. And that kind of, at the time, I thought that was wonderful because, of course, that was a Mormon. But now I look at that and I think, you know, that's kind of problematic because the Mormon church believes its destiny is to become the ruler of the world and to create a religious dictatorship in, in which basically uh, if you aren't a Mormon or especially if you're someone like me, you very well could be executed.